Hi, I'm Mark, and on this channel I talk about UK politics and Brexit from an outside view, although I do know the UK from the inside as well. And this week my channel is dedicated to the Brexit future discussions. Even if many people just don't want to hear the B word anymore, it still has an impact on the political landscape in Great Britain, but especially on the people in the country. And one of the ongoing discussions revolves around the nature of the future relationship between the British and the EU. Well, of course, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, the TCA, already exists, but other models are still being discussed in public today. And today, I would like to talk about one of these models, and in this case, it's about Canada. The trade relations between Canada and the European Union are mainly regulated by the so-called Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, or CETA. CETA is a far-reaching free trade agreement that came into force provisionally on September 21st in 2017. And of course, I want to talk about the key points of CETA. First, we have tariff reductions and market access. CETA has eliminated most tariffs on goods traded between Canada and the EU, and approximately 98% of tariffs were eliminated when the agreement came into force. It provides improved access to the EU market for Canadian exporters and, of course, vice versa. And this also includes access to public tenders in the EU and Canada, allowing companies from both regions to participate in public projects. And secondly, we have services and investment. CETA facilitates access to services and investment by improving market access and providing protection mechanisms for investors. And the agreement also includes investor protection provisions, including an investment court system, or ICS, that regulates disputes between investors and states. And third, we have the protection of intellectual property. CETA strengthens the protection of intellectual property, including copyrights, trademarks, and, yes, geographical indications. It also helps protect products with those geographical indications, such as you will remember champagne or the Parma ham, or jam, by the way, uh, in the case of marmalade, <laughs> would be. And fourth is food and agricultural products. Certain agricultural products and food are exempt from the tariff reductions and are subject to special quotas. The agreement ensures that sensitive sectors remain protected in both Canada and the EU. And fifth is regulatory cooperation. CETA promotes cooperation between EU and Canadian regulators to reduce technical barriers to trade, harmonize standards, and facilitate mutual recognition of certifications and conformity assessments. And sixth, we have the environmental and social standards. The agreement contains commitments to promote high environmental and social standards. Both sides have committed to respecting and further developing these standards in their trade, but also in their investment policies. And seventh, we have the provisional application and ratification we need to talk about. While CETA is provisionally in force, some parts of the agreement, in particular the investment protection provisions, still need to be ratified by all EU member states to fully enter into force. But CETA is one of the most comprehensive free trade agreements the EU has ever concluded and it forms the basis for the trade relationship between Canada and the EU. It offers wide-ranging benefits in the form of tariff reductions, improved market access and investment protection, while promoting high standards in areas such as environmental but also labor protection. And the agreement serves as a model for future trade agreements and it ensures a deeper economic integration between Canada and the EU. And the Canada-EU Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement brings both advantages and disadvantages for both sides. It's always so. That's what compromises are. But let's 
first talk about the benefits. CETA has indeed eliminated most tariffs on goods traded between Canada in, and the EU. And of course, this leads to lower costs for exporters, but also for imported products, which increases the competitiveness of companies. And by eliminating tariffs, consumers in both regions can benefit from a wider choice of products and that at cheaper prices. And the agreement contributes to economic growth in both regions by increasing trade and investment. And the access to new markets and increasing trade volumes, of course, can create new jobs, both in Canada and the EU. And CETA promotes regulatory cooperation, which means that there are fewer technical barriers to trade. And this makes it easier for companies to sell their products in both markets. And in case with the mutual recognition of standards and certificates that reduces the burden on companies operating in both markets. CETA strengthens the protection of intellectual property, as I said, which is particularly beneficial for companies in the creative and technology industries. And CETA provides protection for investors through the investment court system and creates legal certainty for cross-border investments with that. And companies do gain access to public tenders in both markets, creating new business op opportunities for companies on both sides. But I will not keep silent on the disadvantages. The investment court system, the ICS, has been criticized because some critics believe it gives too much power to multinational companies and could undermine government regulations to protect the environment or the public health. And there is concern that national governments could have less control over their own laws and regulations if they are constrained by investor lawsuits. Large multinational companies are often better placed to take advantage of CETA, while smaller companies could struggle to benefit from the new trade opportunities because they do not have the same resources. And there are concerns that regulatory cooperation could lead to a race to the bottom in which lower standards are accepted to facilitate trade, which could weaken environmental and consumer protections. And some critics fear that regulatory harmonization will limit national sovereignty and impair government's ability to set their own rules and standards in these cases. And certain agricultural sectors could suffer from increased competitive pressure as cheaper products from each other's market become more easily accessible. And while some sensitive sectors will be protected by quotas, there are still concerns that not all industries will be adequately protected from strong competition. So some parts of CETA, particularly in the investment protection provisions, have not yet been ratified by all EU member states, creating legal uncertainty. And CETA offers significant economic benefits, particularly by reducing tariffs, creating market access and encouraging investment. However, these benefits do come with some drawbacks, particularly in the area of investment protection and regulatory cooperation, which do raise concerns about sovereignty and protection standards. And as with many free trade agreements, the overall assessment of CETA will depend on how well the countries involved exploit the benefits while addressing the drawbacks. And the United Kingdom could, in theory, negotiate a similar free trade agreement with the EU that creates a relationship similar to that between Canada and the EU under CETA. But we do have the TCA, don't forget that, so renegotiation is theory. But such an agreement would allow for a deep trading relationship, but would be less comprehensive than membership in the European single market or the European economic area. And of course, there are some terms and considerations that would shape such a relationship. First, there are the principles of an agreement like CETA. An agreement modeled on CETA could remove most tariffs and quotas on trade between the UK and the EU, facilitating access to goods markets. But we have that with the TCA. But 
it could improve market access for services, although access would be less comprehensive than in the single market. And cross-border trade and services could be facilitated through mutual recognition of qualifications and regulations. Such an agreement could protect investments through an investment court system once again that sets the legal framework for investors on both sides. And the UK and the EU could introduce regulatory cooperation mechanisms to reduce technical barriers to trade while both parties retain their regulatory sovereignty, in theory. But there would be conditions and challenges. An FTA like CETA would need to be politically accepted by both sides. And this would require new negotiations in which the UK government would need to ensure that the agreement is consistent with domestic priorities, particularly in relation to sovereignty and control over laws and immigration. And compared to EEA membership or previous single market membership, the UK would have less access to services and in certain industries. And in particular, the financial services sector, which is of great importance to the UK, would likely still to have limited access to the EU market. A CETA-like agreement would give the UK more leeway in regulation, but could lead to new barriers to trade if the EU and UK develop different standards and regulations over time. And despite a free trade agreement like this, customs clearance and some controls at the borders would still be necessary which will still slow down trade and increase costs. And such an agreement would not include free movement of people, of course. This was one of the key points highlighted by the UK during the Brexit negotiations. But it would need a negotiation strategy and then the negotiations. The EU has a strong negotiating position and could insist that the UK adhere to certain EU standards and regulations in order to gain this access to the market. And the UK would have to weigh up how much regulatory autonomy it wants to retain. And both sides would need to compromise on sensitive sectors such as agriculture, fisheries and finance. And finance would be the hardest one here. Special provisions or traditional arrangements may be necessary and an agreement could also create frameworks for future cooperation areas such as the environment, research and development and technological innovation similar to how CETA contains provisions on these issues. To be honest, it's theoretically possible that the UK could negotiate a CETA model with the EU, but they do have the TCA and uh, the TCA is what the EU offered in the end. And you remember the long negotiations that were there and the negotiations were complex and they will not negotiate a new trade agreement because there is a trade agreement. And uh, you can really forget this to happen. The Trade and Cooperation Agreement, the TCA, which entered into force on January 1st in 2021, already forms the basis for the post-trading uh, relationship between the UK and the EU. And the TCA is comprehensive. But there are still areas where both the UK and the EU have uh, not completely talked about. And uh, I do have some thoughts on the likelihood and the terms of future negotiations. Because what is the likelihood of first further negotiations at all? It is possible that the UK and EU will enter into additional negotiations to expand or deepen certain aspects of the TCA. And these could cover specific issues such as financial services, which I still doubt, but regulatory harmonization or other economic and trade related areas. And they could go into negotiations to improve the TCA on certain um, Im implementation provisions, but they will not completely renegotiate that thing because the EU always said, even when um, the check of the TCA, it's, it's in the near future. But that doesn't mean renegotiating. That just is having a look at how does it work in the implementation 
And the UK still hasn't implemented a lot of that. We must not forget that one. So there will not be renegotiations on this one. And it was like, you can go back a few years on my channel. Um, it, it's, it's like a bit of a, of a time capsule if we go back a few years on this channel and look at the negotiations between the EU and uh, and the UK, I just say Barnier and Frost and then Boris Johnson um, and, and all the stunts, there will not be new negotiations because the TCA is there and the UK has to implement the TCA. And the EU, as I said earlier in this video, will keep an eye on things. Where do we need to make small adjustments on the implementation process? Because we have the experience now, after five years, it was agreed that we take a look on, on, on uh, all these small things, but it doesn't mean renegotiating the thing. And the EU will not do that. And they will not make such a big compromise or whatever. In the last weeks, I even had to talk about still, despite having a new government from a different party after 14 years, the UK still gets warned by the EU that they need to implement the TCA. And we still must not forget, there are even transitional periods still running. But the possibility for a few spe specific agreements in certain sectors additional to that for energy research environment could be on the agenda, of course. And uh, there's always the talk about the security agreement. Of course, there can be stuff added to the TCA. But while the TCA already regulates the fundamentals of the UK-EU trade relationship, there is certainly room for expanding or adapting certain aspects. But the likelihood of such negotiations, they depend on the political and economic interests of both sides as well as the willingness to make additional compromises and reach new agreements. But as I said, there might be things with the security and everything else, but the core of the TCA will not be touched by the EU. Nevertheless, that was one thing that was discussed, so I had to talk about the Canadian model as well. And if you want to know more, the next video is right here in the end screen. I'll see you there. I'll be back.